This presentation is brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. What the devil could not do in trying to destroy the church on the outside by persecution, the devil now accomplished by joining the church. And all of a sudden, there was great compromise that came into the church. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. I want to welcome those again who are watching to the Prophecy Encounter series. Now, if this is the first time you're tuning in, you do need to brace yourself because we're going to be, you're going to be hearing just one of the most intense, um, controversial presentations that can be coming from the book of Revelation. And we just are praying for God's Spirit to be with us. You pray for me that I'll just say things gracefully, but I also want to be faithful in sharing the truth with you because, as Christ said, the time is at hand. Presentation tonight is dealing with the subject, A Woman Rides a Beast. And this harkens from a prophecy and a picture that you'll find in Revelation 17. Now, in this presentation in particular, we're going to be talking about what is this beast that keeps reappearing in the books of Revelation and Daniel. So what are some of the primary clues to identify the Antichrist beast that you find in Revelation 17? Turn in your Bibles real quick. Revelation chapter 17. And uh, this is where you need to like take a deep breath. Then one of the seven angels, verse one, who had the seven bowls, he came and he talked with me saying, come and I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot, that's obvious she's not good, who sits on many waters, what do the waters represent? Control over many people, with whom the kings of the earth, the governments, have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed, she's clothed, in purple and scarlet, what colors did I say? And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, sounds beautiful, and a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication was in her hand. And her forehead, a name is written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The angel said, did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her. So let's go ahead now and go into the interpretations that you'll find here. Who is this woman? And the woman that you saw, you look in the last verse in chapter 17, if you got your Bible there, it says, the woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kingdoms of the earth. When John was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, what great city was reigning over the kings of the earth? Rome. So what does a woman represent? A woman. A church. So you got a woman riding Rome. If I said nothing else, you ought to start getting it right there. But we're going to keep going. And just, this is, I think, a pretty vivid example of Bible prophecy being clear says the seven heads. What do the seven heads represent? If you want to argue with Gabriel, you take it up with him. But he told John, here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, is everybody here aware that if you just look in the encyclopedia, it's going to tell you Rome is called the city of seven hills. Is there a principal church that has its headquarters in Rome? What colors is she wearing? Purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet are the official colors of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Cardinals wear scarlet robes and the archbishops wear purple. And you'll even find times where the Pope will wear both. What other clues were given there in chapter 17? It says that the woman is adorned with precious stones, with gold and precious stones and pearls. Well, any of you ever been to Rome, seen the Vatican and some of the treasures there? 
it, it's absolutely amazing. It says, the Vatican treasure uh, of solid gold has been estimated by the United Nations World Magazine. It's numbers in several billion dollars. And that's just the holdings of gold. That's the gold that is in the American Reserve. It's in Switzerland. It's in a variety of banks. It's not counting the gold in the actual priceless treasures they own. And it doesn't count the real estate. It does not count all their holdings in silver and the cash that they have invested. They are one of the wealthiest institutions in the world. It says she's got a golden cup in her hand. And if you read in, um, it says the golden chalice in there, you can go to the Catholic Encyclopedia, it occupies first place among all the sacred vessels of the church. Now where is that in the Bible? Is that a Bible teaching? Are there any clear points from which uh, we can draw from Daniel 7 to help us identify the Antichrist power. All right, so now we're looking back in Daniel 7. We're comparing Scripture with Scripture. And it gives us 10 characteristics. I've put them in letters here. And so you can see it'll go A through J. And it says that, first of all, it arises from among the 10. It's a human leader. It uproots three other leaders. It's diverse or different. It's a persecuting power, and after 476 A.D., it divides. It rules for 1260 years, or a time, a time, and the dividing of time. It's guilty of blasphemy. It's uh, changed God's law. He would think to change times and laws. And there's this little horn power that's got, uh, it's unique or different from the others. Does the papacy fit these 10 points that we just saw? Look here, first of all, did it come up from among the main nations that you find in Europe? It did. Where's Italy? It was right in the very middle of Rome. It came up in the middle of the Mediterranean. You notice what it said in Daniel 7? I saw these beasts come up from the great sea. What was the great sea for Bible writers? They had the Sea of Galilee, they had the Dead Sea, and then they had the great sea, which is the Mediterranean. And of course, Italy is a peninsula in the very midst of the great sea. And so that's where it says his power rises up. It says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So pagan Rome, which is the dragon, then gives the very position to this new institution that developed. And you can just read about that. With the conversion of Constantine, you realize Christianity was called religio illicite in Rome to begin with. Christians were chased out of Rome at one point, and Jews. You can read that in the book of Acts. And it was forbidden, and they were terribly persecuted. But over time, um, Constantine was fighting battles on the outside. He was a Roman emperor. And he said, you know, Christians aren't hurting anybody. They're pretty peaceful. Nero wanted to wipe them out, but it didn't work. The more they persecuted them, the more they grew. And he claimed to have a vision. He said, I'm now to fight and conquer under the sign of the cross. Constantine legalized Christianity and his mother was a Christian and almost overnight it became vogue to be a Christian and everybody in the government wanted to be a Christian and all of a sudden all the pagan priests and the pagan gods in Rome they said uh, you know what do we do with our gods and there was a big rush all of a sudden everyone wanted to be a Christian but what the devil could not do in trying to destroy the church on the outside by persecution feeding the Christians to lions, chasing them underground to the catacombs, the devil now accomplished by joining the church. He legalized it. And all of a sudden, there was great compromise that came into the church. For example, you know there's a commandment that says, do not make images and pray to them. It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? You've got to take that up with the Lord. That's what it says, right? Second commandment. Well, they had all these idols of all the gods all over Rome. Man, they had... Someone said they had more idols in Rome than they had birds. They were everywhere. They had, you know, they had Mercury and Apollos and Zeus and all the Greek gods that they mingled with the Roman gods. And they had pantheons of gods. And even Paul, in the book of Acts, he goes and he preaches to the Greeks. He said, as I was looking at all your gods, they had idols and statues of Diana and Athena and all. And when everyone became a Christian, and the Bible said, uh, you know, to worship God. They said, what do we do with our idols? 
Well, they didn't want to lose the pagans, and they said, well, you know, we need to teach them gradually, and so they said, give them Christian names to start with, and so they started calling their idols, Peter, James, John, Jesus, Mary. All of a sudden, everything began to change in the church. Good people, but they began to compromise, and you know, some of the Christian leaders, they said, well, you know, the, the, we'll get more people into the church if we make a few compromises. We'll, we'll bring more in, and that was the whole idea. The transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. Now it says that they got their power, seat, and authority from this fourth beast, Rome. When the emperor moved the uh, capital from Rome to Constantinople, it looked like Rome was going to lose its glory. But listen to what the historians say. Someone might have predicted at that time her speedy decline. But the development of the church and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome, better known as the Pope, it gave her a new lease on life and made her again the capital, this time the religious capital of the world. Where it used to be in Jerusalem, now the Christian capital moved to Rome. And where Rome was the world empire for political power, now it became the spiritual capital of the world. And that hasn't changed in over a thousand years, of course. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. And so instead of it now having a succession of one Caesar following another, the Caesars sort of left town. They began to lose power, but the church in Rome began to gain power. They were actually given an army to enforce religion. And we'll get to that in a moment. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. Isn't that what we just read from the Bible? Got his power and his seat from the, uh, the dragon. That's exactly what happened historically. It would have a man as its head who would speak for the papacy. Uh, and the papacy, of course, has one man, the pope, who speaks for it. So it's a single individual that is the leader of this organization. It meets that criteria as well. It says an authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. What does the word Catholic mean? It means universal. Matter of fact, if some of you, you may even be a Protestant and you may have from time to time read what they call the Apostles' Creed and it says, I am part of the Holy Catholic Church. When I first read that in a Protestant church, I said, what? And they said, no, the word Catholic means universal. And so it is a global movement. It's not just localized. And uh, another statement says here, uh, Pope Boniface VIII said, we moreover proclaim and declare and pronounce that it is altogether necessary for salvation for every human being to be subject to the Roman pontiff. They say this is their teachings that he is to have absolute respect as the supreme authority. It says it was a man with a mouth speaking great things. It goes on and tells us then that this power would pluck up or uproot three other kingdoms. Remember that little horn comes up? Three other horns are sort of displaced because of that. How did that happen? You look in history. It says the three Aryan kingdoms that did not support the papacy, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoth, when the Pope came into power with an army about 538, one of the first things he did was he sent his armies to fight against these kingdoms that would not recognize his authority and did not agree with their theology. And they were destroyed. And that's why you don't see the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and the Heruli anymore. It's because those kingdoms were uprooted, just as it said. But up until then, it had ten horns. Three of those horns were uprooted. That happened between 493 and 538. What time? The last date, 493 to 538. I want you to make a mental note of that. It says it would be diverse from or different from the other kingdoms. It's diverse in that it's not just a government it's a religion. And the Roman church has got about 1.2 billion members at the time of this recording. I just checked the figure. There are about 2.2 billion Christians in the world today because you add the Protestants, but Catholics are the largest single group, Roman Catholics. It goes on and tells us that this power would make war with and persecute the saints. What happened is back in 2000, the Pope, John Paul II, had a year of jubilee and during that year of Jubilee, the church publicly apologized for the actions of the church in persecuting during the time of the Inquisition. It's a fact of history that there was great persecutions that took place. You can go to Europe. I've been there. 
they've taken me in churches and they say, I want to see the dungeon. And you can go to the dungeon. They say, here's the torture chambers. <laughs> and they have these implements of torture on display in the basements of the churches. And so it's a pretty clear fact of history that it would uh, make war, and this is what it says in Revelation 13, that it would make war with the saints and overcome them. They had to go underground during that time. British historian William Edward Leakey wrote, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Goes on to tell us that God's people, the saints, would be given into its hand for a period of time. What is that period of time? So the times and the dividing of time and a time. That's three and a half years. Power was given, look in Revelation 13, 5. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And this is a period of time. Now I told you the starting date, 538. It's when he finally secured his power. And so we're going to look at that. If you go from 538, 1260 years, that's a time, remember, in Bible prophecy, a day equals what? You find that in Ezekiel 4, 6, in Numbers, in Luke. You find several passages that teach us that's a principle. Uh, if you go from the starting point of 538, in 538, the Roman Emperor Justinian left town. He gave the Pope an army. The Pope was the supreme ruler. They began to use force to compel people to believe. Did Jesus ever endorse that we use armies to get converts and threaten with death or, or persecute? No, he said, Who, whosoever will come. It's to be free. It's not to be compulsory. Now here you've got, uh, this is actually a mosaic of Constantine. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD when there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome, better known as the Pope, to be head over all the churches. How did the leader of the Christian church get to Rome? Didn't the early councils of the church happen in Jerusalem? You ever wondered about that? Making the Bishop of Rome the head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. You can also read in the history of the Christian church, Vigilius ascended the papal chair 538 AD under the military protection of Belsarius. And the date is pretty well established. You start with 538. Then it says you go 1260 years, 42 months, same time period. A time, a time, and half a time. That time period is a very important time period. And it's going to reach unto something happening. Revelation 13.3 it says one of the heads was wounded as it were to death by the sword. What does the sword rep represent? Word of God. And the Word of God began to get printed again in the language of the people. They started seeing some of the inconsistencies. It's when the Protestant Reformation started in the 1500s, but finally they lost their political power. It says there was a deadly wound, but the wound would be healed, and all the world would wonder after the beast. All right, so how did this happen? You've heard of Napoleon Bonaparte. He's sweeping across Europe, had great control. He conquered Italy. One of the things that he did is he didn't really like that the church in Rome was not supporting his empire. You know, he declared himself to be the emperor. They had too much influence. You've probably heard of the French Revolution. And so the murder of a Frenchman in Rome gave them the excuse for him to send his general, Berthier, into Rome. He arrested the Pope. He abolished the papal government. That happened in 1798, exactly 1,260 years after 538. But it said the deadly wound would be healed and all the world would wonder after the beast. Another character, a characteristic we learned, it said this beast power would be guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy, by definition, there are two things. It means, first of all, one claiming the powers or prerogatives that belong to God, claiming to be able to forgive sins. And so does this beast power meet those two definitions? April 30, 1922, Pope Pius said, you know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth. The vicar of Christ, which means I am God on earth. That's an official statement, a declaration of the Pope. Pope Leo XIII, the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. 
Union of minds, therefore, requires together with a perfect accord that in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. See, Protestants typically would categorize that as blasphemy. One more you can read in 2 Thessalonians. Paul said in the last days, this Antichrist power will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now that the temple of God doesn't mean Jewish temple. The Bible says, don't you know that you are the temple of God? It means there would be a religious power that would sit over the people of God claiming prerogatives that belong to God. So when we pray, do we need to go through the Pope? Do we need to go through the priest? Do we need to go through Mary? Or through the Holy Spirit, do we go directly to Jesus? And through Jesus, we go to the Father, right? And, and so things changed in the church that separated it from the Bible and it obscured the truth. That's why this is also very important. So that he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Second definition of blasphemy was claiming to be able to forgive sins. Well, if you look in the writings of the priesthood, these, these are not things that I've written. It says that uh, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest. God is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either to pardon or not to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. So the priests decide whether or not God is going to pardon a person. Now that is a very convenient teaching because it means you can't be forgiven without going through the papal hierarchy. But the Bible says you can go directly. I can come boldly before the throne of grace through Jesus. And you know, don't misunderstand. There are good people. And even some of the leadership, I think, don't understand these things. I've had priests that have come to or watched these programs and said, Pastor Doug, for the first time in my life, my eyes were open and they came to Christ and they understood the Bible. And so, you know, you got to preach the truth. And you're not always going to make friends when you preach the truth, but the truth is the truth. And it doesn't change. Jesus said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, by the way, I didn't finish that quote. It goes on to say, the sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes. He follows the sentence of the priest. It says it would go on. This beast power would think to change times and laws. Did you know that in the official writings of the Catholic Church, and you've got the reference there on the screen, it says the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ, teachings of Christ. I, whenever I go play racquetball in Sacramento, I drive by this uh, Catholic congregation, very nice, and they've got a Ten Commandments outside. I appreciate that. And I stopped one time to look at it, a beautiful piece of art. They don't have the Second Commandment. It's been removed. What they did is they divided the Tenth Commandment. Check for yourself. They divided the Tenth Commandment. They took out the one about idolatry so that they'd still have the number ten. They simply say, thou shalt not have other gods. They skip over the whole thing about making idols and bowing down. Now, friends, as I share these things with you, the um, uh, main thing I want you to do is say, what does the Bible say? Did God foretell what was going to happen in the world? Yeah. Now, I've talked a little bit tonight about Catholicism and prophecy. On another night, I'll be talking about, you know, Revelation 17. It says that woman that rides the beast is called the mother of harlots. So she has daughters. What does a woman represent? Church. A church. That means there's others. And because she's a harlot, her daughters are also unfaithful. And here we're finding out that there's a lot of other Christians and other denominations, daughters that have come out of the mother church that are also unfaithful. So I'm going to be talking, because prophecy talks about a lot of unfaithfulness that has taken place in prophecy. Jesus wants to bring his people back to the word before he returns, and that's why we proclaim these messages. The idea of prophecy is redemptive. This isn't about building up or putting down one institution over another. It's about saying, what are the teachings of Jesus? What is the truth that will save us from our sins? Christ gave us these prophecies not to intrigue us, but to be redemptive, to save us. And there's a lot of dear people that are mixed up in false teachings. And with every truth that a person learns, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. It liberates, it saves, it, it helps people to see the light and to understand the character of God better. Can you say amen? amen.
Friends, are you afraid of heights? If so, you might want to look away right now. One of the most famous attractions in the San Francisco Bay Area is the iconic Golden Gate Bridge. While this world-famous bridge was named as one of the seven wonders of the modern world, few people know the story of the brave men who were involved in its construction and also known as the Halfway to Hell Club. Designed by a group of visionary engineers, at 4,200 feet from end to end, the Golden Gate Bridge was at one time the longest suspension bridge in the world. During its construction from 1933 to 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge had one of the best safety construction records of any project during that time. Keep in mind, they would factor in and calculate that one man would die for every million dollars that was spent. So with a budget of $35 million, they knew that loss of life would be unacceptable. This is why the chief engineer, Joseph B. Strauss, was absolutely adamant about using the most rigorous safety precautions that had ever been used in bridge building. He had a local manufacturer of safety equipment design special headgear that he insisted be worn on every job. This became the prototype for the modern hard hat, worn for the first time ever. But the safety precautions went even farther. Strauss provided a special hand and face cream to protect their skin from the cold biting wind and glare-free goggles to protect their eyes. In addition, they also ate a special diet to help ward off dizziness when they were working at those epic heights. But the most conspicuous safety precaution was a gigantic net that was suspended from end to end under the entire construction area of the Golden Gate Bridge. In fact, during construction, this net saved the lives of 19 men who later became known as the Halfway to Hell Club. Now you need to keep in mind, these were some of the most dangerous construction conditions you can imagine. The wind was constantly blowing. They were walking around on iron that sometimes had ice from the freezing fog. In places, they were over 700 feet above the icy waters. Yet the men, coming from all walks of life, were willing to take these risks because it was during the Great Depression and they would get paid up to $11 a day, which was a fortune back then. One of the other benefits of the net was they discovered that the men were much more courageous even though they were walking high on those slippery surfaces because they knew there was a mechanism to protect them if they should fall. This gave them the confidence and the courage to press on and get the bridge built in record time. You know, friends, as Christians, we have a great work to do. The Bible tells us that we get to participate with Jesus in building a bridge that connects heaven and earth. And there are dangers along the way. The devil would like to paralyze us with fear that we might fall or make a mistake. But we know that Jesus has provided a safety net for us and we don't have to be afraid. We can press on with confidence because it promises in the book of Jude, verse 24, he is able to keep us from falling. But sometimes we make mistakes. Still don't be discouraged, friends. If you read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, if we fall, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. So let's press on together and build that bridge with Christ. This presentation was brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry.